thank you everybody for uh, attending today on this uh, great but uh, very relevant topic. I am Scott Mattenberg. I um, am the Director of Solution Advisory Services in GRC here at Audit Board. So, you know, what do we want to actually uh, try to cover today? And this is going to be more of a kind of a conversation among uh, the three of us, but we want to kind of discuss about uh, how internal functions um, can actually uh, be more successful in this kind of accelerated environment to continue to integrate remote auditing into the future of our audit methodologies. We'll, we'll then really spend some time also discussing technology and how we can leverage technology to further build our relationships, uh, be more effective at our audit work and provide uh, a greater level of independence uh, and objective assurance uh, to the organizations that we support. Finally, uh, we we'll want to speak to talent and how uh, we can help our talent and, and those that are prospective future uh, in the internal audit environment, provide uh, them opportunities and be more valuable, not only for themselves, but you know, to the organization as a whole and to the profession. Let me hand it over to uh, Harold for uh, his intro quick introduction as well. Thanks a lot, Scott. As uh, Scott mentioned, I'm Harold Sulfman. I'm the Managing Director of Professional Practices at the Institute of Internal Auditors. Uh, I've had the role for a couple of years. Uh, and in that role, it's a fairly generic title. I have the opportunity to oversee our standards and guidance team, uh, professional practices, as well as Chief Audit Executive Services. Glad to join here. You yeah, Ron? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Eric. And I, I'm the Chief Audit Executive at ACRO. I started my career with Anderson and then I transitioned to PwC for a number of years, both in Brazil here and here in the U.S. And I've been in the uh, role for the last two years, uh, but also uh, led internal audit in the North America and South America regions for the company before. You know, let, let's start jumping into kind of that first uh, topic that we wanted to really cover, um, internal audit. And, and how we have started to to work with remote auditing on on a grander scale, um, which I think most of us have we talked about. I, I think that among the three of us, when when uh, March nineteenth rolled around, I think a few of us said it's going to be a few weeks. And again, as we said, it's almost a year later. Um, and how is that going to change life? It's in you know, Harold, you brought up this is accelerating everything. You know, I think there were plans in place for eventually. But this is put on the fast track. So, you know, I'd love to, to spend the, the, you know, the next few minutes just really start talking about what does this mean from an internal audit perspective? And, you know, I, I guess, Haran, you know, from your perspective, you know, obviously you, you guys have had some technology in place, but, you know, what has been kind of the, the you know, the impact overall uh, to your team, to your environment and, and uh, working in a lot with your stakeholders too, who have, also been impacted. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump ahead here, and then here, uh, please uh, chime in as as, as you feel, see fit. The way that this actually worked for us is, you know, we were already having some impacts before March because we have China operations, and we had our China team already working remote and, and being careful with a lot of things and going through some challenges. So the company was going through challenges on personal protected equipment to, to run the plant and be able to actually continue to run. Acro was also uh, considered a key uh, industry because of the supply, food supply globally. So none of our plants pretty much stopped right away, but we literally turned the key uh, in March to say everybody goes remote on offices and everything that can work remotely. Uh, for internal audit particularly, we were going through our planning exercise and we we're finalizing our internal audit plan for 2020. And we were a few, few days ahead of presenting to the audit committee in, in, in March when everything turned to be remote. So we had to have a very quick turnaround of adjusting our plan and already considering what was happening when we discussed with the audit committee. And then I think one of the key things we had to turn around was performing soft completely remote for the first time ever. So, and, and the team all jumped into this, everybody kind of gathered together and started looking for ideas on how we can make this work, even though not being in the same place. And, and as you said, Scott, I think we still we already had some technology implemented. For example, audit board was already implemented, which helped us document and track and see where everybody is on testing, especially for instance, from a SOX standpoint, 
But we also had some other technologies like you know, Teams that was uh, rolling out in a company. And we were able to actually put our co-sourcing partner and our internal teams in the same environment where even though they were remotely working, they could connect easily and fast and get the answers to what they were uh, questions they had or concerns they had and share the information right away. So I think that's what the, the major key thing that happened right there in March. Uh, and, and it proved itself that it was successful. We're even thinking now, as, as again, we're going through the plan, how 2021 is going to look like even further. Do we continue to do completely remote audits on SOX, for instance, or we need to visit some sites? That, that's the, the key thing and the key question that we have right now. Yeah, and I'd like to get back to, uh, to that question on kind of the site visits. And I know we were talking about that and developing that audit plan and obviously the challenges involved. You know, Harold, I'd like to get your perspective. It's maybe some of the CAEs you've been talking to that um, may have not had technology or weren't quite ready for it. You know, it, it, you know, what have you heard and seen from that perspective? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, and I think Iran's story is, is a very good one and consistent with those that have been successful, not just stayed even, but actually moved ahead and, and, and provided even more value to the organizations. You know, I think when we were planning this session, I, I shared, I had the opportunity to actually be in person at the IA's uh, General Audit Management Conference on March 15th, 16th or so, and I was flying home on March 17th. It was, you know, we'd just gone to a full virtual event I remember thinking on the three or four hour flight home from Las Vegas, this is gonna be strange, as you said, to be locked down for a couple of weeks. And you know, I, I joke, it's almost a year later and here I am in my basement getting ready for the next GM, which is also gonna be virtual. And when I started, when I actually got home and got back into working as a veteran of this profession, you know, my first thought was, how do we keep moving? How do we, being in the field, working in, you know, coat closets, so to speak, in the small conference rooms. And when you're in the office working in a tight-knit group is part of the culture of internal audit. This is not a, this is a hands-on profession. This is an in-the-field profession. I, I really question how the profession could keep moving forward. And so as we started to do research and we started to do, we did a number of quick polls from the IA to our audit executive center members and other chief audit executives. And what we found immediately was from a statistical standpoint, or sort of quantitative standpoint, I think it was about two thirds of internal audit functions had re reviewed and re-revised their risk assessment, even in the first weeks and month of the pandemic. And I think it was something like three quarters of internal audit functions had updated their audit plan, which was in my mind, great. And then as we dove in and started having a lot of conversations with CAEs and, and the anecdotal pieces came through, two things really became clear. One is that organizations, functions within organizations that had strong relationships existing with their management, with their board, provided an opportunity to add value during the pandemic. We're, we're called upon to do things either within their normal scope or expanded scope. And organizations that had internal audit functions that had made investments in technology were way ahead, both you know, products like, like audit boards, technology, Zoom, Teams, where they're able to stay connected and, and share work with management. They, they really had a leg up. Organizations where the internal audit functions did not have those investments, that did not have good relationships, good strong relationships, were, I would always say, controlling for industry. Because some industries just naturally got hit much worse than others, especially those in, in, in the retail field. Um, but controlling for industry, those that had the, the relationships and the investments in technology were, were given a seat at the table as, as, the, as crisis management and resilience plans kicked in. The challenge, of course, and we'll, I think we're going to talk about it a little later, is how to, if you haven't had those in place, especially building relationships, becomes, it becomes challenging. It's not impossible to do, uh, but it becomes more challenging. Yeah, no, no, and I know we're going to talk a little deeper about uh, technology in a few minutes, but, you know, you bring up about the risk assessments, and I know, you know, early on, uh, back in, going back to April or in May of last year, uh, we, we had a lot of discussions with various audit audit teams and, and the like about risk, and again, it was suddenly, you do, most organizations were doing these annual risk assessments, but the objectives changed immediately overnight. And uh, those that 
had that technology, you know, such as you know, audit boards, you know, risk oversight, we're able to quickly reassess the risk. And we, we have clients calling just that, that normally it, it takes you potentially two, three months to complete a risk assessment and trying to figure out how can I do this and expedite this faster based on, on this critical need. Um, and, you know, we're also seeing is there have been so many other things that have happened in 2020, which is a year I think most want to forget. You had to keep reassessing that risk assessment because it wasn't just that the COVID was around. There were, there were other geopolitical things that were taking place. So we'll, we'll get into that further. Haran, I want to just real quickly come back to you about your audit planning. And, you know, obviously, you know, there was impacts on how you would complete your SOX works or even your, your audits, you know, and the planning, the field work, the reporting, um, and, and, and even communicating with your stakeholders. And a lot of them that was new to them. How did that change further? And, you know, how do you expect it to, to be in 2021? As you're building this yeah, out again? Before I even answer that question, I just wanted to come just comment on the risk assessment we, we did a similar yeah. thing we had to literally do a monthly update and and literally go every single audit committee uh, last year updating them on what the new risks are um and at one point we had a, a final risk assessment before the pandemic and we had an overlay of the pandemic and we had a pandemic only risk assessment and then we had one after which kind of merged everything so it was it was all over the place was it was it definitely a crazier in that perspective so talk a little bit about uh, planning. Last year, what we've done is we, 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 we had to go back to the internal audit plan that was approved in March. And then we had another meeting in April for, with the audit committee where we had to go back and say, okay, from what's going on versus what we can do and, and, and looking at all perspectives, what, have we need to, what do we need to change in the audit plan? And what we've done then was we, we assessed and said there, there are a few, for instance, site visits. You mentioned site visits before, Scott. So there's some site visits that we felt that we are not as often going to the site. And by doing it 100% remotely, it's not going to be as effective. So we kind of pushed them aside and said, we're going to probably pick those next year. Let's focus on the ones that we, 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 we are there regularly and we can be there regularly or we know the process. We know the stakeholders really well, so it's going to be an effective remote audit uh, that we can be able to do in 2020. Now, that being said, of course, there's limitations to what we can do, and especially when we talk about manufacturing companies like we are, a lot of it related to inventory, to uh, receiving and shipping products and, and material handling and things like that, which it's really hard for us to audit remotely. Yeah, we could do, we could probably use, you know, remote cameras and things, but we decided to scope those out in this year and focus on the areas we could actually do remotely um, in 2020. Now, if you're asking about 2021, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're looking to put those back in and with the expectation that we're gonna be able to go to the sites and part of uh, a review that we are on at, at the sites and looking at that. Uh, what percentage that's gonna be? I would guess it. I think I, I, I mentioned to you guys before, if, if we all guess how the new normal is gonna look like after the pandemic, after vaccination is, it's, is broadly available for everybody, it, each one of us is gonna have a different opinion and it's gonna be really, really hard to pinpoint what this is gonna look like. Uh, but I would guess that we, we will continue to travel somehow, but less, instead of going three, four weeks to the field, we're going one week out there, get more laser focus on what we need to do at the site and then do everything else remotely. Hey, Ron, if I, if I could jump in, I think that's a great assessment and a, a couple of points to make. You know, one of the, the things that made me very proud about the profession was in, in one of our last quick polls, which we did it, towards the end of the summer, and it, we asked, and we we're looking forward as to what the, where the profession will be going. One of the questions we asked was, will you be doing your risk assessment more frequently going forward? And the overwhelming majority said yes. And we asked, you know, will you update your audit plan more frequently going forward? And the overwhelming majority said yes. So that's one nice adjustment. The other piece, and you talked about re remote auditing, is I, I am immensely impressed by how the profession has adapted. And that's not necessarily to suggest that it is ideal to not go to these places. I mean, if you're a if you're a manufacturing business like like yours, Haran. Yeah, you need to be in. You need to be there. You need to see. You need to walk the walk the floor, count the inventory, observe the counts. But you know, realistically, if I think about myself as a as a somewhat, I think the old term I always heard was graybeard. 
uh, somebody who's been a veteran. I, I look at myself now, and I, I got—I actually physically have a gray beard. My assumption had always been: if you're doing an audit of a location, you need to spend your entire time at that location. That isn't necessary. That's proven to not necessarily be true. And, and to your point, Ron, that's not necessarily to say that you shouldn't get there or there aren't procedures that you need to do when you're there. But if it's a three-week audit, what we're seeing is as we take the the past way we've done things, layer in what we've learned, what was a three-week on-site audit might be a week before and a week after uh, of work from headquarters, from your normal office, from your basement, you know, your home office, and, and being very laser focused and, and spend a week on site, which if nothing else, especially when you talk about going to China, how much, you know, I, I can only imagine how much time of inefficiency you lose on planes and transfers and, and time zone adjustments that you get back by not having to do that. Of course, you need to be laser focused. And, and, and you know, we talked a little bit in our planning for this session about the, uh, the use of data and making sure that you have a very clear focus on what you're going to do when you get there and being very data-driven in doing that. Just two things there. I think the, the technology about data, that, that's what we discussed, right? So the data analytics piece, right? And, and, and being laser focused on that behalf. I think that's another technology point that we need to embed. And to be honest, I think we're still at ICO trying to get there. Um, and, and we have plans on how we're going to get there. But the other thing you mentioned about traveling, I think I just wanted to mention that you know, we did a, a feedback from the my team on things that worked and didn't work throughout 2020. Lessons learned from it to, to try to leverage those to the future. And one of the key things they said was exactly what you just mentioned, like you know, travel time versus productivity time. I can be testing instead of be traveling, so I, I probably added more time there. You know, if you think about the the costs and the expenditure when we're putting our, our plans and budgets together, you know, the, the travel costs. And it adds up quite a bit. And I, I think what we're seeing um, and what I'm hearing from a lot of the companies is, you know, we could reallocate that to that technology that will actually make us more efficient and effective. Um, you know, and I know that we also spoke about too is even with these site visits, and, and we'll also get to talent in a few, but you know, it's also where are your talent? You might have folks now that are more geographically located. Uh, which will help on those site visits. But also too, um, what I'm hearing more and more about is uh, deputizing individuals uh, to help on those site visits in, in those remote places that you can have further reliance on. So there, there are a lot of things that uh, we're seeing. I, I guess you know, from the both of you, what, what about communication with the sea level? You know, obviously everyone's remote now. How has that impacted in, in at least getting audit reports out, um, you know, managing any uh, issues or, or just having that communication of what's happening within the business that could impact the audit plan and the like? I, I was just going to mention the way we are approaching that at ICO. I think the C-suite, of course, it, it, it's always a challenge. Even Sometimes, even if it's at the office, I think you have to understand what's on their agendas. And, and that doesn't change now with the remote environment. Uh, understand what the agenda of that executive looks like. What are you going to be talking to him? And the touch point that you're going to do, it's going to be meaningful for them and for us when we do it, right? So I think that doesn't change. But on, on the other side, I think, yeah, we don't have that walk the hallway and, and bump into different people. And, and, and see them regularly at the office and get to know different things that are ongoing. My suggestion is leveraging as much as you can any type of social media and, and other things. So a great example I, I shared with you guys on the planning sessions, when we were having some risk assessment discussions this year, one of the SVPs for Agco, I, I've learned that he, uh, his brother was like a quarterback at college, one of the top schools that, you know, they have some good carbacks coming out of that college. And, and I just started a conversation about that with him, so with an icebreaker, and then, you know, talking about it led to our risk discussion, led to him actually sharing things with us on what's going on in his area of the business and everything. So it, that type of connection that we're trying to figure out and build, but that's just the icebreaker. I think the, the key things are understanding what's going on in the business, regular touch points with those guys, uh, sit down with them and understand what's going on, sit down with them and have the right questions, have the right agenda points to discuss it. Uh, and that's, that's a great point. One other piece I can add is a, a joke I've heard a couple of times, which is that we're not working from home. We're actually living at work. And I think that brings an interesting dynamic. And it's going to be 
or every organization is going to have a slightly, you know, maybe slightly or, or more significantly different culture. But the definition of what the work day is, you know, if, if your office was traditionally a 8.30 to 5.30 or 8 to 6, or that's sort of broken down. And in many ways, the fact that we are connecting at different hours, at different times, I think some people take more breaks during the day because their children may be there or they have to, they ha they have to teach their, they're literally teaching their children in many cases provides more opportunities to have those connections with folks who frankly are almost impossible to get on their calendar, you know, less than a week out. Because if you're more, if you're able to be more flexible and, and some people are and some people are, and they're able to be more flexible, all of a sudden that meeting at two o'clock, which you had to schedule six, seven days in advance becomes an impromptu discussion at seven o'clock in the evening or seven 30 in the morning or over lunch when you're, you've, you're, you've, you've got a, a quick break. And it depends, again, depends upon the culture of the organization, but we are hearing more and more from folks who are saying it's actually sometimes easier to catch people because they're not as rigid in being in the office and, and having, frankly, sometimes an, an administrator schedule their time and keep them on pace. You're able to, to find them in the off times and weird times. And yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not point. sure if that's for the, a better thing or a worse thing. And I will defer to everybody's individual judgment as to whether you know it's a longer day with more flexibility is better than a you know sort of shorter day where you drive into the office, drive home in the evening, but you could leave everything in the office uh, when you when you walk out the door. You know, kind of let's let's look at the topic. How is how is uh, technology building relationships, enhancing and providing greater assurance? Harold, I, starting with you, it looks like a lot of folks still haven't moved to a GRC solution, and and we see that this. The facts and figures are pointing that it's accelerating. Uh, do, you, do you think that will turn over time? I think it will. I think 2021 is going to be a, a challenging year, if for no other reason than, than belt tightening. You know, when we looked at, when we did polls around what we foresaw as the future impact, you know, the longer term impacts of the pandemic, one, we saw extreme belt tightening. Thankfully, we saw a lot less belt tightening around staffing levels, that, that internal audit functions were able to, for the most part, and I don't want to, you know, there's probably people out there who have been in different situations, but for the most part, been able to hold the staffing levels. Travel budgets absolutely demolished for even going into the future. And the belt tightening, you know, hits a little bit with some of the technology investments in the very short term. As we get back to normal, I, I certainly hope so. I, I, I see no reason why uh, internal audit functions should not be leveraging the opportunity to make investments in technology. And I think we will see that, especially as we get back to, and I, I hate to say it, you know, back to normal. Uh, I hate that term at this point. It truly has shown that those who had the investments in technology had a huge leg up in terms of the opportunity to, to add value over the last year. Yeah, and, and I know from what I have seen here and speaking to clients, we we actually saw an increase here at Audit Board of, of folks reaching out and actually, you know, not only buying, you know, SOX management, audit management, but uh, we had an uptick in, in things of, of, you know, what we had in, as far as risk oversight and risk management, our compliance, just teams just going we we need something. There's there's just too much to do. We, we got to. And one of the big things too is being able to connect with your stakeholders. Haran, you had audit board before all this started, and you know, love to kind of get your view on how how that worked. You know, as you know, once everything sort of locking down and continue is what do, what changes do you see with uh, further using the technology and you know, it's throughout 2021. I think what, what happens, Scott, is it helps everybody be on the same platform and working in the same system and being able to share information through the system and results, trackers. So managers were able to take a look and see how things were progressing and, and, and manage that in a very, very uh, real-time basis. Uh, reporting and also Working with the stakeholders, you know, leveraging some of, some of the technology just to be able to interact with the stakeholder in, in a different way, collect uh, management action plans, and, and just streamline the, the reporting process. So I think that, that that's part of it. And the other part of it is we benefited a lot on the reporting side to be able to report that uh, up, upstream in the organization to senior management, to audit committee, 
so using a lot of the, the tools and technology that we have built into the tool, to be able to then demonstrate that we're, we have a better eye on what's going on. Yeah, and you know, I think you also mentioned that you had, it wasn't just your, your staff that were continuing to use it, better usage among your, your co-source partners. Right, so because we have the co-sourcing and the internal teams, right? So everybody's on the same platform and we have even access to our external auditors. So essentially, we don't have to be concerned about how I'm going to transfer the test from internal audit to the external audit availability for him to see it, how I'm going to make sure that he only sees the things that we finalized. Or So we use the tool to all manage all of that. And without that, we would probably be looking into sending emails or, or trying to put like a SharePoint uh, site somewhere where we could upload information, download spreadsheets, and, and would just make it more problematic on version control and everything like that. So it, it does help a lot. The, the co-sourcing partner has access to the same things as my internal team. So I, it's, it's one team. It doesn't make a difference if they're, you know, working with the co-sourcing, working with us, or even, you know, for floor for external on it. So. And, and the other thing to keep in mind we're talking about internal auditors working more remotely and, and wanting to leverage technology in the future, and not necessarily traveling everywhere. The same is going to hold true for our stakeholders. The same can hold true for our, our auditees, our audit clients. So even if we had the budget and the time frame and we're willingness to go to, to office locations and, and spend you know three weeks there, we're going to get there and find that some of the key employees aren't there. They're at home. Or and I think we'll probably talk about some more. Or they never are there. They are remote employees as well who may be hired someplace else and working in a in a different jurisdiction. And so the ability and frankly, our businesses will start leveraging new technologies to take into take that into account. With an offset presumably being an office space and an in person costs. So we have to be able to leverage the technology and integrate so that we're taking advantage of the fact that. The person, I mean, it's simplistically, the accounts payable person doing the reconciliations, you can't walk by their office and pick something up because they're not there either. They're filing things electronically. They're keeping electronic records. And if we can integrate and we can pull those into our work papers, into our technology, into our reviews from our homes or our home offices, that's probably going to be the only way we're going to be able to work. Well, so I was just going to add to what Harry was saying that the, the control execution also changed to be electronic. And the, early in the pandemic, one of the key things, for instance, that we were involved as internal audit at Agco was to support business on thinking ahead of which controls will be affected, how I turn something that's done on paper to electronic, and how do I make that available, how do I make that efficient, and don't lose the ability to have the same control environment and effective control environment uh, that we already had. Right, so that transition also happened on the business side. And, and again, just going back to like how we interact with our stakeholders, one of the key things is also like, you know, just sending the request list and adding the support documentation for tests and things. So it made it easier to just upload into the system. Everybody has access to it. We can transition that to the external auditors. We don't have to then say, you know, go back to the same control owner, ask for the same information, we send to the external auditor and so on and so forth. So I think it helped all along. Now, I, I guess I had a question for the both of you. You know, there's new things, and we, we talked about analytics, RPA. Um, all, all these are coming out faster. It, it, what is uh, what is it that you're seeing? Um, what are some of the trends as far as the impact on internal audit, and then also managing with your your, your management solution? Yeah, I, I, I will quote a, a colleague of mine, Tim Barishon, who's got a. I'll put a. I'll put a shameless plug, and I think he's watching today. Uh, he's got a new book out, Ready and Relevant. And one of the chapters in there says, automate everything. And this was written before the pandemic started. You know, automate everything. It, especially, and we see the challenges being larger, more sophisticated organizations have made investments in, in RPA. But I actually think the, the, the gain, the efficiency gains happen much more so in smaller functions. You know, those that aren't going to be able to hire two more people, three more people as a blip on the screen. It is not easy to do. It is sometimes not easy to make that, that, that business case, but I think it's a business case that you need to make to make some of those investments because it is the future. And, and, I'm, and I'm fearful for those internal audit functions that, that aren't able to make investments in RPA and advanced data analytics and visualization, things that we've been talking about as a profession for 
I'll say years, but it's been decade, almost decades now, they're going to start falling farther and farther behind. And farther, not just behind the benchmark of other internal audit functions, but farther behind the expectations of their stakeholders, because businesses are becoming more automated. And decision-making data is coming to the users faster and faster and faster. And if we're, if we're still in, frankly, sampling mode of looking at the last six months, you know, and picking 30 transactions, our, our, our conclusions, our advice, just doesn't, isn't going to be relevant to, them, to, our, to our internal stakeholders. Yeah, and Harold, I, I see it in, in two different ways, RPA and, and automation and things like that. I see it from the business side and, and how much the business can leverage from it. And then how do we as internal audit have to change our approach when we're auditing that particular side of the business that automated pieces of the process or, or their controls and understand how we, we need to change. We, we need to, more and more, we need to have IT skills and business skills all together to kind of like be able to audit those pieces of the business in an in a effective way. On the other hand, if you look at internal audit and how internal audit can leverage that and putting data analytics and RPA probably together in this, this bucket, uh, how much can we make it automated and more efficient, more effective to our own profession? Uh, data analytics driven to your point, not simple and 30, just randomly. Can I, can I run data analytics? Can I, can I pinpoint the outliers and then focus on those outliers to take a look at instead of trying to, for a population of thousands of records, try to find 30 that potentially is going to drive my conclusion and the control. So I think that's where internal audit also is going to have in the future. Of course, I think I haven't seen a lot in that, that direction in any of the, uh, the shops that I've talked to, any of the CAEs i talked to, but they already have automated pieces of internal audit but definitely the business side of things is running faster. We probably need to catch up to that. Yeah, no, it, that's a very valid point. And you know, I, I uh, did a webinar uh, early in the year on RPA and data analytics, and it's it's something that where the audit function really needs to collaborate with the business and it, to ensure that there is a cohesiveness on what's being used. And also, too, you know, from an RPA standpoint, it's a, a lot of organizations are saying, you know, we shouldn't just be building this on our own. It, it is a a tough challenge to do. And um, there are things where you, know, you can use various organizations that specialize that and you almost use it on a, on a per needed basis and almost outsource that function, which can be a great way, an alternative way to leverage. We have one last topic I think will be relevant for everybody today. And so why don't we kind of transition that and we can also kind of keep talking to the technology aspect as it impacts everybody, but that's audit talent. And, you know, from what we're seeing, and we had a great conversation about this is, Harold, what you brought up is, where is that person going to be? And, and we're seeing this and, you know, we've kind of had the conversations as most of us have been at this localized level. You, you hire someone that lives within an hour of your office, that comes in, does the work, hops on a plane to travel where you need to. We're, we're now starting to see, and I see it in my organization, I've seen to a lot of folks I've talked to is, it's now national. You're, you're hiring people in, in remote areas. And, and I think, you know, plainly is we're going to see that this is global. You know, wh what are you guys seeing? Um, and, you know, I, I know, Haran, you were mentioning it's you have China operations and there may be consideration is, you know, do you get a resource there? Um, I'd love to hear from you guys on that. And what, what are the pros and cons that we're going to see from this? Yeah, I think we're going to see a, a different dynamic. We always talk about this we're calling war for talent. And that you know, high-performing internal audit functions. You know, to be a high-performing internal audit function, it doesn't just take a great CA. It doesn't just take great great methodology. It takes great people, the right people for the organization. But to your point, that has always been theoretically limited to the people within, you know, an hour's drive or or, or, or public transportation of the office. I think we're going to see a new front in that war for talent, which is the concept of if we're not if we're going to be working a lot remotely, if we're going to spend less time sort of in the field, the people don't necessarily need to be in the same place. If we have the right technologies, which for, for an employer standpoint, really opens up the opportunity to hire people that you have never had access to. But there's a, there's a flip side to that, which is, and it, I think it's overall a good thing from the people perspective, all of a sudden they're not limited. So they can go almost anywhere. You, you know, if you're the big dog in a small, in a small town as an employer, all of a sudden your people, could be looking elsewhere. 
and we've already seen this to some extent from a cost of li- differentials in cost of living. If your office is in a high cost of living location and your willingness all of a sudden to hire people who are going to be resident in lower cost of living locations, all of a sudden your pay scales become extraordinarily attractive and, and the talent becomes in many ways extraordinarily cheap. If you flip that around and you happen to be an employer that's in a lower cost of living location, all of a sudden some of this talent looks very expensive if they happen to reside in you know, in Manhattan or San Francisco or, or Boston or Chicago. But I think it's almost like, like what eBay did to, to some of the market for, for goods. It's gonna be much easier to match up talent with the right jobs and vice versa. Yeah, and Herod, I think you mentioned that, you know, about hiring someone that was not local to, to the organization and having somebody that for I mean, maybe the first time or, or the, one of the first times that happens, right? Um, when, when we're discussing this, I think one of the key things that we think about is, you know, the, the pool of professionals is not going to be local, it's going national easily. If things are remote, you can hire somebody. We're located in Atlanta. We can hire somebody in the West Coast, and that person can work for us because it's going to be all remote or pretty much a lot of it remote. And then when there's need for travel, that person can travel from their location to the site, do the site visit, go back to their homes and continue working remote, right? So I think it's going to open up more that visibility into the national side of things. And not only national, I think we can talk about global. How much can we hire resources in different parts of the world with the right skills that would fit your team that you need? Of course, there's challenges to all of that. You know, when you talk about national, you're talking about high income and lower income areas or, or cost of living areas. Of course, the employers would have will have to understand how they are going to manage all of that. So somebody that was working in Manhattan right now and it's going fully remote, that person decides to move somewhere else, which has a very low cost of living. Yeah. Are they going to keep the same salary? Are they change it because where you live and so on and so forth? Questions to be answered. I don't know any of us would actually have those answers right now. Globally, it's even more challenging, right? Uh, how do you hire somebody in a country that you don't have operations at? I think, you know, Scott, you mentioned China. Yes, we have global operations. We have China, we have South America, we have Europe all over. So it's easier if, if a company is global to do those shifts and with locations where we have established operations. But if you don't have that established operation, also it's going to put some challenges into how do you manage the whole thing, right? So I think those are the key things. And I think uh, questions to be answered uh, in the future. You know, since the pandemic started, we've had, uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to hire someone uh, who, like Iran, is, is located in Atlanta. He started in the, in the fourth quarter. He's done a fantastic job so far. We really hit the ground running. Been a real asset to our organization, which, you know, I always plug, if he's an asset to our organization, he's an asset to, to all of you in, in the profession. He and I have never been in the same room together, to the best of my knowledge. I always see him sitting down at his desk, and he's got a little bit of a house background. And, and he's, he's somebody who reports to me and is, and is you know, I review his work, and we have interactions all the time. But it, it can work. There's no doubt. I have no doubt about that. Yeah, and you know, and kind of circling back to one of our previous conversations, I, I think as we start hiring remote in various locations, um, it really puts the emphasis in what this is really about: accelerating the use of technology for that. To to do this, you're going to have to have some form of solution. And if we cut down on the travel and cut down on salary wages, I think there can be a, a reallocation uh, of some of those budget numbers to to put towards uh, some some type of solution. One last question in that it basically is, what are the skill sets that future-oriented auditors should be striving or obtain? And I think this is very relevant as we start thinking about talent and you know where we're heading into a direction. And what type of skill sets uh, would you guys think that we these young folks that are coming in the industry should have or obtain or that we should be considering? One of our, our I'll, I'll keep referencing some of the quick polls that we did because we asked that question uh, as far as the longer term impacts. And it was there was a mix. There was a mix of technical skills, some you know, particular risks, data analytics. But the number one competency that chief fund executives across North America answered would be more in demand coming out of the pandemic was communication skills. The, the ability to be flexible in, in how you communicate and you know that not everything can be done, you know, one-on-one sitting down at a table, being able to be 
more innovative, more creative in how you communicate. And that surprised me because that's, you know, that's something I just think of. It's always been there. We've always had to be good communicators to be good internal auditor, but it's the one that chief audit executives saw being even more in demand going forward. Ron, if you want to add? No, I was just going to say exactly the same thing. Just being comfortable with technology, being comfortable with remote working, and, and using that ability to just interact with stakeholders and, and oddities in the same way we would do in the office, but just do it remotely. I think those are the, one of the key things that's going to happen to the future. Oh, great. So, you know, let's let's take a few Q and A uh, that have come in um, before we wrap up. Here is one is you know talking about engagement especially within the teams, you know, now we're all working remotely. How, how do you work with, you know, keeping those folks engaged and uh, not being in the same room, not having that camaraderie and also ensuring productivity is there? Uh, it, it's just about making sure that um, we, we do the same things we would do regularly. I, I said this before, we were at the office, nobody was always looking over the shoulder of every single employee to see productivity out there. So we would assign tasks, we would see the results, we would track the answer, track, track progress. I think it's going to be the same way. I, I don't see that changing significantly. Um, and I think the major thing is this change of mindset. I think the company's changing the mindset of somebody not being at the office doesn't mean that that person's not working. I think that changes how you also uh, look at it, react to it, and, and uh, are comfortable with people working remotely. I think that's a great point. I mean, the other thing I would emphasize is we leverage technology. Sending an email is a very easy thing to do. If you have a technology, and I know a lot of organizations do, like a Zoom, like a Teams, don't be afraid to schedule time or impromptu reach out to somebody and have a video conversation. It may seem to some to be inefficient, and I, I highly suggest turn your camera on. You know, it's it's okay to be in a T-shirt. We were, we were joking, Harad and I were joking about this earlier today, you know, that is is the... And this is a question that we literally have. Our office workplace is going to become more casual because a lot of folks just work in T-shirts and shorts all day and they see each other that way. You know, it's okay to have a messy background. It's okay to be wearing a T-shirt. But just having that face-to-face -face connection and being able to, to see somebody and the, the nonverbal communication, one, it helps, I think, when you're doing audit work and you're having discussions with auditees. Uh, but it also helps in, in working with your team to make sure that people feel connected. And it's it's worth, a, I think it's worth a little bit of inefficiency to even have those water cooler talks, those water cooler conversations. We actually have a Zoom chat group within our, our part of the IA, which is called the SPK water cooler, which is there's almost no work that goes on in that Zoom chat group. People just post memes and they have jokes. It's all It's all appropriate workplace conversation. But it's just meant to be a way to keep connected to each other, uh, and we've had we've done. I've heard a lot of internal audit functions have done this. You know, having uh, happy hours where the, everybody just gets on, you know, gets a drink or something after work, you know, at five thirty, six o'clock, and just connects and talks about non-work stuff, just to keep that personal interaction going. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we talked about here, and another question that came out, it's, it's really important. Is there are a lot of organizations that that do have the funds to to by audit technology as we're advancing. And you know, for there are several organizations and small teams out there, you know, maybe two, three person, you know, maybe four. Love to get your thoughts. How can these type of audit shops make the pitch, you know, that hey, you know, to the to management, we need to get some form of audit management solutions as we continue on on this remote world and, and environment to be more productive and actually add further value to the organization. Well, I think I think one aspect of that is to think about how you allocate your resources as it is. And we've talked about a lot of remote work. And you know, if you think about your budgets, how much money do we spend on travel? And I think those those who work in hospitality, the airline industry might hear hate me to say this, but take advantage of that. Don't just give those funds back. Look to reallocate those funds away from the travel and, and towards technology. Because that's ultimately where you're going in the future. And, the, and if you can pitch it that we're going to travel less, we're going to spend less nights in hotels, less meals, but leverage the technology as a one-time investment that can be cap. And frankly, I mean, think about accounting, it can be a capital expenditure that's spread out over a number of years. It, it can be very helpful. 
You know, I guess, you know, we're kind of really about at the end of the time here. I just wanted to open up to both of you for any final thoughts on on this kind of accelerating the evolution of internal audit before we hand it over and uh, for a few housekeeping items to end out the day. Now, I'll jump with you, Haran, first. Yeah, so uh, I, I think just it, it's all to be answered. A lot of things we're still to see and see how things are going to shape up. But a, a lot of things that we've done this past year, we probably would have would have done the same things in, in, in 8, 10, 12 years, who knows. Uh, and we just accelerated that in a shorter year, and it proved out itself that it works. It proved out that the teams can work remotely, audits can be effective as done remotely. Of course, with its caveats that we need to probably be there for certain things. But definitely, I think the profession itself is just changing a faster pace and getting to where we should be uh, much faster than it would be if the pandemic would have not have hit us. And, and just, just one thing I just wanted to mention also that Herod was talking about T-shirts and so on and so forth. I think as, as we are all remote, you said the back, messy background and so on and so forth. I think even if you talk to any of the stakeholders in your organizations, they're going to also probably expect that, you know, and, and see that and don't see a problem with a lot of those things. And I just wanted to mention one quick thing that I was having a call with the audit committee chair the other day. And... Uh, we had the co-sourcing partner on the call as well. And her daughter came in to say goodbye or something. And we're in the middle of the chat with, with the video on. And there was no problem with that. You know, it was just kind of like, yeah, moment right here to say goodbye or something and continue the conversation. Yeah, Harold, any final thoughts? If, if we had a magic bullet, if everybody got vaccinated tomorrow and we were able to go back to the way things were before, don't do things just the way the way we did it in 2019. 2021 or 2022, whatever it is that we're able to get back to, to do whatever we want to do, we should be doing what we did in 2019. Take the advantage and, and modify it for what we learned through 2020, 2021, because ultimately that's the way we can best serve our organizations enterprise-wide, is, is to, to take the, the lessons learned uh, and not just go running back to what, what we're comfortable with. And, and that goes, and we, we, we talk about the IA a lot, not just to audit what you're comfortable with, to take on, you know, what's, you know, follow the risk, as, as Richard Chambers often says, but in terms of the methodology, don't just go back to 2019. 2019 plus lessons learned equals a better tomorrow. Uh, and as Iran said, an, essentially an accelerated evolution of our internal audit methodologies. Well, Haran and Harold, thank you for your time today um, and to everyone in the audience for, for participating. And it's going to be uh, exciting to see what happens with the internal audit industry in the coming years. Thank you again for everyone for attending.